Let's look here a bit of this promise. It's taken from the first chapter, the third verse of the book of Joshua. Here it is. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Do you believe it? Well, I know it's true. I have proven. But this promise is made not to the out of you. It's made to the inner you. Maybe you're not even aware that there is an inner you, a real you. In the New Testament, it's put in this manner. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually deserved. We are told the first man, that is the outer man, is of the earth, earth. The inner man, the second man, is the Lord from heaven. Now this book from which I read the quote is the book of Joshua. The word Jesus is the Greek form of the word Joshua. They are identical in meaning. They mean literally to say, there is a savior in man. And all the promises of the Bible are addressed to that inner man, that second man, that is the Lord from heaven. Not the outer man. The outer man is limited to the evidence of his senses. He is limited to what reason allows, what it dictates. But the inner man has no limitation. Every place that the sole of his foot shall tread upon, the same give I unto you. Now let me show you how it's done. For I was confronted with what seemed at the time to be an enormous problem, an impassable barrier between myself and my objection. I hadn't seen my family in Barbados for the entire war year. So the first ship out of New York City that sailed for the Indies after the war was over, I sailed with my little family for Barbados. We took a boat that took us to Trinidad, and from there we flew to Barbados. On arrival, my brother asked me, when I intended returning to America. Well, this was early January. I said, we are home after so many years. I would like to remain through all maybe the end of April and return around the 1st of May. Then he said to me, of course, you arranged your return while you were in America. I said, no, I didn't. He said, Neville, how could you have left America that is the capital of the world? Everything goes on there, especially in New York City. And if any passage could be arranged, certainly it should have been done in New York City. Do you realize that there are literally thousands, tens of thousands of people waiting all through the island for passage to America? And little Barbados has nothing to offer. There are only two ships that fly the water. One sails out of Boston carrying 120 passengers. And one sails out of New York carrying only 60. And I am told that all space, all available space, is already committed right through the month of September. And here it is, January. Not only the space is committed, but there are actually thousands of people waiting on a waiting list. If you put your name down with your family or three, you are at the bottom of the list. It will take you years to get out of there. I didn't tell him what I'm telling you now. I didn't wish to disturb him, because he didn't know or was not familiar with this technique. I made no effort to book passage. I simply put my name, yes, at the bottom of the list. But I wasn't concerned. It was January. And I am in Barbados for vacation. So I'm not really concerned and for my vacation about the lack of passage. I wanted to get back to New York City around the 1st of May. So this is what I did based upon this promise. At the very end of March, I saw the ship that sailed for New York, leaving the boat, leaving the bay. I had a good mental picture of what she looked like, a small one. So that day, as I returned to my hotel, after lunch, I sat in a nice easy chair in my room, and this is what I did. I knew that if the inner man could perform an action, that the outer man would be compelled to duplicate it. For whenever the action of the inner self corresponds to the action which the outer self must take to appease desire, that desire must be realized. So I made as lifelike and as living a representation as possible of what I would see and what I would do and what I would hear were I physically present on that ship. Well, I knew one thing I would have to do if I failed. You see, in Barbados, there is no deep water harbor. That is not as yet. So all passengers must take a small little ship. We call them tenders. That's a little lock. I move off maybe a mile or maybe three quarters of a mile to sea. 
Then your little ship is lashed alongside of the big ship. And a gangplank is lowered, and you walk up the gangplank. That's one act I would have to perform if I sailed on that boat. I could perform it as a visitor, but the emotion of someone who actually is sailing differs from the emotion of one who is only visiting, being a friend of. So I had to catch a sort of a mixed emotion. For it was a peculiar sweet family. I was leaving a very wonderful and large family behind me that I had not seen in six years. Although I was returning to a home that I loved in New York City, I was happy to get back, or to be sailing, but I was sad at sailing. That sort of feeling that mixed together joy and woe. As the prophet says, joy and woe are woven fine, a garment for the soul divine. So I knew exactly what he meant, the experience of mixing these two emotions into something that was a sweet, sweet shadow. So, with my, fixed in my mind what I would have to do, I Sitting in a chair, like I'm sitting here, I first induced a dream state. And the reason for that is this. We are told in the book of Job, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens up the ears of men and sees us their instructions. Well, I knew the one who would see it was within me, for God is in man, not on the outside of man. God in you is for me much. So the one in me would have to be my own wonderful I am. That's the God in man, man's country. And that inner man is his son, his only lovely begotten son, which is my imagination. So sitting in that chair, I induce a drowsy state. For this is one thing it does for That dreamy, drowsy state that borders upon sleep. But you induce it only to a certain extent. If you carry it too far, you go to sleep. And then you lose the control of the direction of your attention. That's something you must always maintain and be under your control, not the control of another. So I had to induce it, but only to a certain point. And just before I slept, I arrested that state. You may say that consciousness is likened to an ocean or to a tide. It ebbs and it flows. The ebb tide is the very moment when my critical faculties are being exercised. I know exactly where I am seated, the studio, and what I'm doing. That is not the state of the flood tide when I do not know what I'm doing, which is the unconsciousness of sleep. But between these two extremes of the flood tide of unconsciousness in sleep and the egg tide when all the critical faculties are being exercised, there are any number of intermediary states between these two extremes. I wanted the state that borders upon sleep. So because I'm speaking of a tide, I will call that now the high tide. This high tide lifts the man easily off the bar of his senses, where he is so long laying stranded. So I was stranded on my senses, for they told me I couldn't get out of the island. All that I heard my mother tell me, my father tell me, they confirmed my senses. So here I am stranded on the bar of my senses. But I knew I could lift myself off what they knew, and what my outer man knew, the critical faculties knew, and actually sail away to my place in New York City. So all I wanted to do was to perform an act, which action implied that I was there. With that clearly in my mind, I took myself in this chair, induced the drowsy state, and just before I lost control of the direction of my attention, I started the action in my imagination. And this was what I worked out. I felt that if I walked up the gangland, and it seemed to me real, and then on the top of that ship holding the rail, I could look back at the little town of Bridgetown, and have that feeling of sadness, and yet a sweet sadness, because I was happy that I was saved. So I assumed I stepped off onto the gangplank, and then step after step, right up the entire gangplank, making it as natural and as real as I possibly could. I gave every step all the solidity that I could muster, all the sensory vividness that I could actually bring to play upon that act. When I got to the top of the imaginary stairway, which is the gangplank, I became aware that I had wandered from my task. For I had set myself a task to walk up the gangplank and only the gangplank. Then I found myself completely gone. I was not on a ship. When I became aware that I had simply floated away from my objective, I brought myself back to the very first step on that gangplank. 
And there I went over and over again. I did it over and over and over until that action took on the tone of reality. When it seemed to me normal and naturally real, I then felt I was actually performing it in a right way. So I kept on doing it, and then I went sound asleep in the act of walking up the gangplank. This was on a Thursday afternoon, I would say about 2.30 to 3. The next morning, Friday, at 10.35, the Alcor Steamship Company called me and offered me passage on the next sailing, which was the 21st day of April, putting me back in New York City on the 1st of May. And so I know from my own personal experience that this thing is true, that every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, the same give I unto you. If you could now conceive of what you would do, were you in possession of what you want to be in this world, and then having conceived it so that it's clear to you, a vivid representation of exactly what you would see in you and touch. Well then, do it. Do it over and over until it seems to you real. And while you are doing it, in that dreamy drowsy state, allow yourself to slip into the deep of sleep in the act of doing it. When you wake the next day or five minutes later, in my case, I woke maybe half an hour later. I was inwardly rehearsed in what would take place. All the people who played their part, the teamship agent, and all the people who did it on the ship, they were bystanders in my scene. I made my scene so real, and because of their physical presence, they became related to my scene. And because they were related to it, they were drawn into my drama and had to play their part. I didn't think of the captain's name or the steward's name or any person on the ship who might be sailing as a passenger. I didn't concern myself with how it would happen. I knew it would have to happen. And in less than 24 hours, I had confirmation of my passages I saw as an outer man seeking and couldn't find. But the inner man can find it. This is based upon this simple principle. That whenever the action of the inner man corresponds to the action which the outer man must give say to, I would say, realize his being or to appease his hunger, that must be done in the outer world. I know so when I returned to New York City, I told my experience to my audience at Chung Ho. A man present said to himself, he didn't say to me, he said to himself, I'm going to destroy this principle. I'm going to do it tonight. And this is what he did. He hadn't climbed the ladder in years. There was no occasion for it. But that night, because he had never climbed that, not, not never, but he hadn't climbed it in years, he thought he would do that, for there was no occasion for climbing the ladder. So he sat in his and he took this imaginary ladder and up he climbed the ladder. He did it over and over, climbing the ladder, until he went some to see in the act of climbing up a ladder. Four days later, he visited a plane he hadn't seen in years. And she asked him, as a gentleman, if he would mind climbing the ladder and rearranging a picture beyond her reach. He didn't realize what actually took place until he was on the very top of the ladder. And he told me afterwards. When, when it dawned upon him, that he had proof on the principle, he became so emotional, he almost fell off. Now, don't you try to disprove it. Don't climb a little ladder in the hope to disprove it. You want to prove it. Rather, put yourself into some big, noble state. Be a wonderful man, a wonderful woman. Whoever you are, be noble. Construct a little drama which implies the fulfillment of your dream. And then do it over and over and over and make it natural. And I promise you, wherever the soul of your foot shall tread, the same give I unto you of it. Now, after a moment for my sponsor, I'll be back with an instant, by far the most interesting thing I could tell you this day. As I'll tell you, these promises are made to the outer man. Not in something that he himself must do. He doesn't do it. He hears it out But he must tell it to the inner man, and the inner man must do it. I told the story you have just heard in San Francisco. A blind girl was in my audience, and she was faced with this problem. Although blind, she was earning a wonderful, wonderful income, and of all things, a title. But they had recently changed the routing of the buses, and she found herself spending two and a half hours one way on three buses. For being blind, I tell you now, when you say blind, her eyes are removed. They are little plastic eyes when you look into her eyes. Surgery moved them years and years ago. 
So, in her position, getting off one bus, she must wait and hope that someone is passing by, seeing her limitations, and help her across the street. So she crossed herself, and after two weeks, she could not make it in less than two and a half hours. And in previous days, when she had only one bus to take, she made it in 15 minutes. So that night, this is what she did. She sat in her living room, and she, first of all, investigated what it would cost by taxi. That was completely out of the question. She thought in terms of giving up her apartment, but she had a long lease on it. For all the things that she thought of rashly, she couldn't put into effect. She came to the conclusion that going from her place to the place of work in a car was the only solution. She couldn't afford a chauffeur, and she couldn't buy, for she was blind. But a car seemed to her the only solution. So this is what she did. Sitting in her living room in a nice easy chair, she assumed that she was seated on the front seat of a car. She felt that the person next to her was a man. She could stop all the steel in his sleeve. Then she felt the rhythm of the car. Then she could smell the gasoline. Then she felt the car move. She thought it stopped against what she thought to be a red light. Then she felt the car move on. She finally came to the end of her imaginary journey. She turned to her companion and said, Thank you very much, sir. To which he replied, The pleasure is all mine. She got out of that car, and then she imagined she heard the car, the car click as she slammed in her imagination the door of the car. And then she walked up the flat, leading to her office. The next night, she did it all over again. She did it until it seemed to her she was actually on a car. She could actually see herself on a car and riding down the streets of San Francisco, stopping in front of her office building, getting out, thanking her passenger, or rather her driver, and then making her way up the ramp. The second night, right after she had done it, and given it the tones of reality, her companion read her the evening paper. And there in the evening paper, was the picture of a man who was interested in blind people. Having read the article, she thought she would call him. They looked his name up in the telephone directory and found his name and called him. He said that he was interested in the blind, as said in the paper, but this was no time or place to call him. If she would write him a long, detailed letter of the nature of her problem, he would take it under consideration. She sat down and wrote him a letter and explained her problem simply a problem of transportation. Next day, when he got the letter, he simply read it and put it in his pocket. On his way home, he stopped in at a place where he stopped every day before returning to his home. And that happened to be a bar. So he stopped in at a bar. He knew the proprietor and had his little martini, whatever he had. And while he was there, he was prompted to tell the blind girl's story. Having told the story, a total stranger between the two of them, because the other one was a salesman for some liquor house, he overheard the story. And he said, well, I make a good living, I employ dozens under me, and I do nothing for this community. Here was a girl who not only is taking herself off the back of taxpayers, but in her letter she states that she has trained nine other blind people to earn their own living. Here this girl, who should be supported by the taxpayers, earns her own living, and she's taught ten others, rather nine others, to earn their living. And I, who earn a wonderful living, I do nothing for the community. I will drive that girl to work. The man who received the letter said, If you, a total stranger, will drive her to work, I who am interested in the blind and make it my job. I will then take her home. And that was a bargain. Now that's almost three years ago. I saw that girl just about six months ago. And she told me that it is not fair one day or five days. Five days a week, these gentlemen pick her up and take her to her work and take her from work home. And here is the strange part. The very first morning that she drove with one of these men, she turned to him as she got out of the car, and she said, thank you very much, sir. To which he replied, the pleasure is all mine. The identical words that she in her imagination had used to make the thing seem natural were used the very first day. Now, twice she did it. On the third day, she was being driven to work. I say to you, if she can do it, and if the speaker can do it, you can do it. I have done it a number of times, and I teach others to do it. It's a simple, simple technique. You must learn to believe in the inner man and the reality of what is to you at the moment an invisible person. This invisible world is not really unreal. It's the most real world imaginable. And the inner man related to it 
is a far more real thing than the outer personality that you came to and think so much in this world. Trust. These things will never fail. Whenever the action of the inner you corresponds to the action which the outer you must take to appease your desire, that desire will be realized. For this whole wonderful world of ours is nothing more than the appeasement of hunger. That's why we built it. We made it to satisfy our longings. You have some intense longing, some wonderful hunger in this world. It may be for a job. It may be an increase of income. It may be some wonderful harmonious relationship in a home that is now strange. No matter what it is, construct a little action. This action inside that your dream has been realized. Then take that action and inwardly do it over and over and over until it takes on the tone to reality. Then to you it seems natural. Then you may sleep. But I do believe in that sleeping during the action. In some strange way it seems to hasten the interval between the doing and the realization of it. Of course you don't have to sleep. But I have found some experience. But if I can fall asleep while I'm performing the action, the action which implies the fulfillment of my dream, that I quickly collapse the time. In little Barbados, it took me less than one day to have passage on the ship, although the ship was not sailing for another 21 days. Still, I knew I was going to sail on that ship. I had tangible proof. I had the passage in my possession. This girl took me two days. Although she was driven on the third day, she really only did it two nights. Two nights sitting in a living room, she assumed she was on a car. She could smell the gasoline. She, she took all of her senses and hallucinated them. You could hallucinate sight, smell, touch. I can take my hand now, place on this book, and assume that I am following something that is not clear to be seen by anyone. And so lose myself in it. That to me it seems natural. If I do it until it seems natural and see while I'm doing, do you know it will become my possession? That's how everyone should live and really eventually live in this world. So instead of going out and simply getting things that are not yours, or I would say, killing in order to survive, you don't kill to survive in this technique. You die in order to live. You let go of the things that you've kept alive, just drop them, and you simply inwardly feel yourself into another state, and feeling yourself right into the situation of your fulfilled desire, you sleep in that state. And so you'll know the wisdom of the world in a dream. In a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and sees the very instruction. We are refreshed this night in the part we were to play when we open our eyes on this outer world. And all that we will do, we do under compulsion. For this inner motion is the force by which the outer event is brought to pass. If you know it, then don't just know it, do it. Or if you do it, I promise you, you will get the result. But you must apply. Application is important. Everyone in this world must learn to live by their imagination. And only as you live by imagination can we truly be said to live at all. Now here, in this book of mine, Awakened Imagination, you will find that case history of the blind girl. Read it and apply it and become the man, the woman, that you want to be. You can be anything in this world that you want to be. If you know these wonderful promises, accept them and then test them. You're invited to test them. Come prove me now and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great there is not room on earth to receive. You can conceive of the impossible state, impossible to the inner man. All things are possible to the inner man. Now I'll be back in just a moment with just a thought for today. today is to remind you that every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon has been given unto you. Goodbye.